Okay. All right. A couple of things that I've seen based on what, what you guys are, are the questions that you're, you're already asking. Okay. So first of all, um, there's three, there's three things, three sheets that are on the canvas page that kind of go through kind of a summary, right? Three helpful summaries is the module, I think on the canvas page, but one of them just talks about just complex numbers. One of them talks about Euler's identity. So all the stuff with E to the J theta. And then one of them talks about MATLAB and how MATLAB deals with all the complex number stuff. All right. One of the things I keep seeing basically from everybody that's asked me a question so far, uh, not everybody, but almost everybody that's asked me a question so far is this statement I got here. All of MATLAB's trig functions and the exponential function, EXP, assume that you have radians as your units, okay? That is the mathematical, if you look at the way that sine and cosine and tangent, if you look at the way they are defined, they are defined assuming that you have an angle and radians, okay? Your, your calculator, when you put it in degree mode, MATLAB doesn't have a degree mode, okay? Calculator has a degree mode. I get that. Your calculator does a conversion to radians to be able to make that work, okay? Some of you will know, some of you may know this already, I don't say it, but I might as well say it. There is a set of functions, sine D, cosine D, tan D, and all basically all of the stuff with a D after it assumes degrees, all right? I don't use those. And the reason I don't use those is because you'll end up screwing up later when you try to plot the sine of omega T and you'll use sine D of omega T. That doesn't make sense, all right? But if you, if you want to, you can look those things up, all right? There, there is degree-based sine functions, but they have a D after them like that, okay? Again, I, I don't think it's that hard to convert between degrees and radians, but I do know that that's one thing that causes you guys a lot of confusion because you're used to a calculator that has a degree mode, okay? All right, that's where a lot of the issues come up. What I wanna do real quick is I wanna look at, I just want to remind us what we did last time. And I want to look at how I would approach one of the homework examples that, that you guys have, okay? So I'm gonna look at that Euler's identity thing. So we, we talked last time, we've got three unit systems or three equivalent ways of looking at these. The rectangular, um, the polar, and the complex exponential. And they are all directly related to each other. So the picture I have here, right? I've plotted this guy in the complex plane. I can relate the imaginary and the real part. So if the imaginary, if, if, the, if this guy is Z equal A plus JB, if these guys are all equivalent, which one do I label A and which one do I label B in this? In this diagram, which one is A, which one's B? Yeah, A is the real axis piece. That's this, this guy here. All right, and this is B, correct? This height is B. All right. What I say is there's no need to memorize formulas. There's a, there's a the, you know, the scientific term is a shitload of formulas, right? That you could memorize for this stuff, but you don't have to, it's a triangle at the end of the day, right? If you remember your trig, all right, the formulas are pretty easy. Looking at this picture right there, how do I figure out the angle of Z? Yeah, arc tan of B over A, right? If I'm looking at an angle, it's always the case with a triangle the tangent of an angle is always equal to B over A, right? Now, the problem is when I'm in what quadrants? Two and three, all right? So quadrants two and three cause me problems, okay? Now, from this, you should be able to see that A, the real part, is related to the hypotenuse and the cosine. And B, the imaginary part, is related to the hypotenuse and to the uh, sine. Okay, so let's look at let's look at an example. One of the things I see is I, you know like problem one on the homework looks like this. I stuff like this. I give you two numbers like that in mixed format, right? One of them's in complex exponential, one of them's in rectangular, and I say give me the angle and the magnitude. Okay, I have a lot of people. You know, when, when I look at people's code, what I what I often see for this. You know, let's let's say my variables were called x angle and x magnitude. 
I'm going to make up numbers for these. I don't know what the answers are. We're going to figure them out here in a second. But let's just say the angle was 200 and, well, so let's say it was 24 degrees and magnitude was 10. Again, making that up. But for a lot of people, I see this as their, as their MATLAB code when they show it to me and they say, well, it's, it's wrong, right? <clears throat> so I know what you're doing. You're trying to do the good thing there. And you're, well, I see a lot of people that have tried to do this by hand on paper, and then they've written down the number, right? That's nothing wrong with that. That's good. You're learning when you do that. What I would say is, is don't do it still step by step, all right? But let MATLAB do the work for you, right? What, there's no sense in, MATLAB's a pretty much more powerful than your calculator. There's no sense in doing a pen and paper, do it in your calculator, and then putting a number into MATLAB, all right? What I would try to do is I'd try to do the step by step. So I wanted to walk through, I've got code how I did this, but I, I wanna see, I'm gonna talk through this with you guys here. How would, I, how, would how should I approach this? If I wanna do this sort of step by step, where should I start? If I'm gonna do, if I'm adding, so first of all, I got two complex numbers here that I'm adding, okay? One's in rectangular form, one's in, um, in uh, which, the exponential form. How should I add them? What format is best to add? Rectangular, okay, rectangular is best to add. So the first one's good for me, right? So what I would do is I would probably say in MATLAB, I would say A, I'm gonna call this guy here A. I'm gonna call this guy here B. And I'm gonna get those into rectangular form. So I got nothing, I got no work for me to do for, for A there, right? I would just, at MATLAB, I would say minus 24 plus 19 times J. All right, that's a complex number now. Okay. Now, what about B? How would I get that into rectangular form? Yep. Okay. Which trig functions would do I do I have to do? Um, three cosine. Okay. Six. Okay. All right. So, so, so three times um, the, the real part is cosine. You go back to your formulas here, right? The formulas, if you want to look at the formula sheets, you can do it. One thing to, to do, I always suggest is to actually, you should probably look at the function. You should actually look at it, like actually plot it, see what it looks like. We're going to do that as I go through this, but he's right. I'm going to do this and go to the trig three times cosine of now, because this is what did I say about MATLAB functions? They're always assuming radians, right? So the way I would do this is I'd say minus 66 times, I always do times pi over 180, like that. That's the way I do it, all right? Um, there is a function called rad to degrees and degrees to rad, you could use those too, okay? Um, that's the real part of it. So I shouldn't actually be done there, should I? What's the imaginary part of that? Yep. So I got to add to that plus J times three times the sine of negative 66 times pi over 180. Okay. Now I've got that guy in the right form. Okay. Now, if I wanted to compute X, how would I do that in MATLAB? Yeah, one thing I could do is I could say X equals A plus B, right? That would work, right? Now, if you're trying to do this, you know, nicely at home and you're trying to learn this, right? You know, so probably the thing that, that I, what you could also do is you could, I would, I might, this is, this is true. X equals A plus B, you could totally do it. What I might do is if you're really trying to learn it, you could say, well, X real, if you wanted to, you could define that variable and you could say that's equal to the real of A, right? So that's a MATLAB function. It's on that, that sheet, real of A plus real of B, right? Those functions real, those will pull the real part for you, okay? All right, that's what you're, so, cause what I see, what I think a lot of you guys are probably doing is you're calculating with your calculator three times cosine negative 66, then you're writing that down on a piece of paper, right? 
And then, and then you're taking negative 24 and you're adding it to whatever you got from this. And then you're taking 19 and you're adding it to whatever you got when you did three times sine of negative 66, right? Might as well just put it all right in there at that prompt, let MATLAB be the calculator for you. All right, that way all the numbers are, are right there. Okay, get, get used to it that way. All right, it's, it's powerful. All right, if I, if I tried to do the imaginary part, let's say I had to find a variable X imag like this. How would, I, how would I use that same approach to get the imaginary part of X? What's that? Yeah, and so the command, anybody know what the actual command is to get the imaginary part? It's not, it's not imaginary. I am a G, imag. Okay, and this is, if you go to that, that summary sheet that I posted on Canvas, this, all these commands are there, okay? If you go through those. So imag of B plus imag of A. All right, that'll, that'll tell me what these guys are. Now, is the imaginary part gonna have J in it? Does the imaginary part have a J in it? No, all right, J is like a unit vector, right? So the J is not there, right? So I've got that down. So what I did here, let's look on my screen. All right, is I wrote a little piece of MATLAB code, all right, for this guy. All right, so here's, here's what I wrote out, right? This was A, this was B, all right? And then I wrote out X real and X imag, okay? Now, we're gonna look at those in a second, but the reason I did it, what did I ask you to do? I asked you to do the angle and the magnitude, all right? So if I asked you to do the angle and the magnitude, once I've gotten to this part, Right, so I've defined X real and X imaginary. How would you figure out the angle? Let's do angle. How would you figure out with these two variables that I created? How would you figure out the angle? Arctan of imaginary over real, almost. That's, that's good, right? But what do I wanna do before I just do the arctan? Plot it, see where it is, right? Because arctan doesn't always work, right? Arctan only works if it's in what two quadrants? First and fourth, all right? If I'm in the second or third, I gotta add 180 degrees to it, okay? So, so let's look at this. Let's, let's say if I look at these two guys here, let's evaluate my code. So what I do is I go in here and I'm gonna evaluate this. All right, and I see X real is negative 22.7798 and X imaginary is 16.25. All right, so if I look at my, let's write that down. All right. All right, so I'm gonna, where is that? <clears throat> Second quadrant, right? So the real part's negative 22. This is our real axis. This is our imaginary axis. So that means this guy is over here, negative 22. I don't know, I'm probably not drawing that perfectly to scale, but he's over that way, all right? <clears throat> so how do I get the angle of that? So first of all, when I say get the angle of it, what angle am I referring to, right? Here's a vector. Where am I measuring that angle from? Where's that angle measured from in this case? In other words, I should be able to, to draw an angle. Where is that angle? It's here, right? That's the angle. How far am I from zero degrees? Remember zero degrees is where the real axis points. So I wanna figure out how far over is that guy, okay? Because he's in that other quadrant, way I'm gonna do this is in MATLAB, I would say a tan of X imag. Let me go back to it. And notice, I don't like, I don't ever like to write numbers down. All right, you guys, you guys are, you guys write numbers down a lot. You, you write, so you do your math by hand, then you write numbers in. You're gonna make a mistake when you do that. If I make them in variables, I won't ever make a mistake, okay? That's something that's hard to get your mind around when you haven't ever done it before. But if you do it in variable form, you'll never make a mistake, all right? Because you're just, you're just basically, you're not writing down a number and risking the fact that you're gonna transpose numbers when you do that or something like that. So if you variables like I'm trying to do here is a useful way to think. All right, so a tan of X 
imag divided by x real. Now, what's that angle going to be and what units is that angle going to have? What units will that angle have? If I just go into MATLAB and I do a tan like that, guy's going to be in radians. So if I, I, I can either convert it to degrees a couple of different ways. Again, I, what I do is I say multiply by 180 over pi. That's sort of a unit conversion, right? And then I got to add to it 180 degrees, okay? This is, I guess I would call this, I don't know what I called it there, X angle like that, okay? What if I wanted to get the magnitude? So X magnitude, how would I do that? I've already computed the real part and the imaginary part, so how do I get that? Yep, so I'm gonna take the square root of the sum of squares. So MATLAB square root, S squirt, right? S-Q-R-T, right? Square root. If you don't know that, you say, you know, Google MATLAB square root, right? And, you, and it'll come up with the function that you're, you're trying to do. So square root, and I would say X real squared. So it's the caret plus X underscore imag. squared like that all right now i've got a formula and all i got to do is make sure i put the inputs in right as long as i put the inputs in right everything's right okay the only thing you got to think about probably is this is this statement right here this guy requires the most thought because a tan you don't know what 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 quadrant that's going to be in. okay so you have to actually look at the thing you're you're applying it to because you may have to arbitrarily add something to it all right. Um, I guarantee that'll be probably where half of you start losing points on the exam. All right. Is you won't look at it before you do it. Okay. And, and that's, that's important. The other half of you lose points because of the radians and degrees stuff. All right. It's, it's not that hard. It's just, you gotta, you gotta keep track of it. Okay. So the, the code that, that I write here basically looks like this. Okay. Um, and actually, this isn't the code that I write. I, so this is, if I'm trying to learn it, this is the code I would write. So here's, I wrote A, I wrote B, just like we said. I defined X real and X imag. I then created this number here, right? And then I did a couple of other things. So this, this was the other stuff that we did, right? Now, when I actually go in there, what, what I do is I actually write a different piece of code. Um, so let me go into MATLAB here. What, what I do is I actually would have probably just said this. I would have said X equals negative 24 plus 19 times J. And I would have said plus three times exponential. What is it? Negative J 66. I would have said negative J times 66 times pi over 180. Why did I do pi over 180? Um, to convert it to radians. Yeah, because all the MATLAB functions, all the native MATLAB trig functions assume that I'm in radians. And we count exponential, like I said there on that first slide today, right? We count exponential as one of the trig functions. All right, and we're gonna keep doing that. And you're gonna do that forever. Yeah. So I'm submitting uh, yeah. Um, you, you'd have to have different variable names for each one. Okay. Now, one, one thing, one thing that you might do sometimes I find the, the MATLAB thing in Canvas kind of clunky. So what, what I'll do is I'll, I might just run it in like the MATLAB window you know, on my computer and then just paste in the code when I'm done, paste it into Canvas and just do it one at a time like that. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I would recommend getting yourself comfortable with that because the, the more you get comfortable with that, the, the, the better you'll, you'll feel about it eventually. All right. Um, but yeah, back to this. All right, notice how I did this. This is, this is gonna give me the answer right off the bat, 
right? Um, I can ask this guy two things. If I want to know the magnitude of this, I would just say, what's the abs of X? All right, that's also listed in that MATLAB summary sheet. All right, abs is the magnitude function. So I don't need to do anything. I don't need to get the real part. I don't need to get the imaginary part, any of it, okay? Abs just tells me the answer, all right? If I want to know the angle, I also don't have to think either about arc tan and all that stuff. I could say, I want the angle of that guy. Now again, it's a MATLAB function. So what, what's it going to output for me? Or radians, okay? So I'm going to multiply that guy by 180 over pi to convert it. Now, if, if I run this, so let's, let's first do this. Let's run the code that I had originally, okay? All right, so it, this guy says the angle was 144 degrees, and he says the magnitude was 27.99, okay? All right, let's do this thing here now, where I just put the problem in straight away, see what I get. I get the same thing, all right? Now, I had, I've had conversations with some of you guys on Discord. You're like, well, but on the test, I'm not gonna be able to do this, right? That's right. On the test, I'm gonna to wanna to see the steps, all right? So you should be pushing yourself to learn the steps. Some of you guys are gonna be like, yeah, this is awesome. I can, tonight, you're gonna to try to get all your homework done because you're just gonna do what I just did right there, right? But you need to know how to show me the steps when you get to the test, okay? That said, I told you guys you can use MATLAB right? When you actually take the test. All right. I'm expecting if I were you and I was the professor, right? And I was taking that, that test. I would put it into MATLAB just like I have right there to make sure that what the work I did by hand was correct. Right. If I'm giving you the opportunity to use that tool, use it. All right. I'm totally fine with you checking your answers with MATLAB. I'm not fine with you checking your answers via Chegg or whatever the new thing is or your friends. Right. But if it came between you and your and your MATLAB window, that's great. OK. All right. But I do want to see that you can see the steps. OK. But if you want to take an alternative approach that allows you to check that your answer is correct, do it. OK. All right. So um, but get comfortable with those kind of intermediate variables like that, rather than kind of hard coding just the answer. All right. But you can still kind of go through those sort of things step by step. OK. Questions about that? All right, all right, so let's, let's keep going. All right, the other questions that you guys have had, so this, in my notes here, all right, that code that I used is right here. Okay, so you can look at this later. All right, and I, I will put these, I, as soon as I can, right after class, I'll put these into Canvas so you guys can take a look at these, okay? All right. Last time we talked about this Euler's identity stuff, because this gets into the other questions that I'm, I'm getting from you guys a lot, all right, which is on problems probably about four and five um, on the homework. Euler's identity was this thing that basically e to the j theta is cosine theta plus j sine theta. If there's a magnitude in front of it, then you just basically multiply both sides. And then you, I proved this the other day, I can take these, I can take this expression and his buddy r e to the minus j theta equals r cosine theta minus j, j times r sine theta. I can do different things with those and prove these two statements as well. All right. So um, we're going we're gonna to talk more about that today because a lot of the questions I've been getting relate to, to the use of this stuff as it gets into problems four and five. All right, so one of the things I said the other day is there's this really tight and close relationship between sine waves and exponentials. All right, now <clears throat> what I'm showing here um, is just going back to a regular sine wave. So first of all, looking at this guy, this picture here, how many periods of this sine wave does it look like I have plotted? How many periods are there here? Two, how can you tell that there's two periods? Why does it look like there's two periods? What's that? Two full periods, two full starts and ends. Yeah, that's right. In other words, the values repeat twice. 
All right, the definition of a period is how long does it take for the function to repeat? So I basically say, when is X of T equal to X of T plus capital T, where capital T is the period. All right, when I'm looking at a waveform, this was one of the questions on homework too. When I'm looking at it, I'm looking at something in time. All right, but we often talk in terms of frequency. Somebody trying to ask a question online? Isn't it three periods in there? Um, it is three periods, yes. All right, I did it from negative T to two T. Yeah, so three periods. The reason he's saying that is, I guess probably the simplest way is, here's one period right here, this time period. Okay, that's one T. Here is a second T. And here is a third T, like that, all right? So I can see that there's three periods that are actually there, good catch, all right? Easiest way to measure that is to look at the time between the peaks. Now, no one, no one typically talks about the, what we care about when we look at sine waves, how fast does it repeat, okay? And you guys have been using that for a long time probably, right? So. What's the, what's the frequency of your Wi-Fi network at home? Anybody know? 2.4 gigahertz, probably. I guess nowadays they've got a five. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, so, so there's 2.4. There's a 2.4 gigahertz sine wave, right? That's basically being transferred. What does that mean? So 2.4 gigahertz means what? How many periods do I have in a second in a 2.4 gigahertz signal? But 2.4 billion, right? I have 2.4 billion periods that happen in one second. That's how frequently it repeats, all right? That's a lot of repeating, all right? But that you wouldn't, so that, that I don't know, whatever that's like in nanoseconds, right? That that would be repeating if I talked about its period, all right? But we talk very often in terms of a period. And some, some people will talk in terms of angular frequency. We don't talk in terms of angular frequency very often, but it's how this guy is defined. In general, we say this guy is A, cosine omega t plus phi, all right? So you've got stuff on the homework that looks like this, okay? This is a pretty common thing that you're gonna see all the time, particularly in 2112, okay? Looking at this, in this picture, I defined what phi is, all right? Phi, so here's zero right here. Notice how I define phi. Anybody, anybody wanna, looking at the picture there, Explain that in words. How did I define phi? The angular velocity plus phi by the one. Well, yeah, that's that's what I have written out there for sure. That's right. But so physically, looking at that picture, right? Looking at the picture of the waveform, how would you define it in terms of that picture? Offset. Yeah. Offset. How? Yeah, so if I, if I look at this, where would cosine start? If I drew one period of, a cos, of cosine of theta, where would it start? What, what, so at, at theta, in other words, I say where would it start? At theta equal to zero, what, what's the value of cosine? Yeah, it starts, at its, it starts at one. Cosine itself starts at its peak value, right? If I look at this, I'm saying, well, the peak actually occurs a little bit later, all right? So if, if, the, if the peak occurs a little bit later, Okay, that means that this guy has shifted from there. Now, looking at what I've drawn right here, is that shift negative or positive? In other words, if I shift a waveform in that direction, forward like that, that's a negative shift. All right, that's a negative shift, All right? <clears throat> So that, that, and, and you probably have seen, you saw that probably in high school algebra stuff, right? Um, but that's, that's important to remember. That's a negative shift when I see that, okay? So there's, there's and there's a close relationship. So in other words, sine, sine functions, and I, we almost always use cosine, but I call them sinusoidal functions because this cosine omega t plus phi, I could, I could use trig identities and I could turn it into a sine wave, a sine function as well, right? There's a trig identity that will turn this into an equivalent sine wave. So we almost always just call them um, 
sinusoids, but we, we write them in terms of cosine, all right? And you're gonna do that all the time in, in circuits too. All right, so the other day I started using this relationship here and I said, well, if I just took A e to the J omega T plus phi, I can use this Euler identity thing and I can write it like this. All right, so in other words, I, I broke this guy up using Euler's identity. What does that tell me about A cosine omega T plus phi? How does that relate to this? What would I say that is? The real part of it, okay? The real part of it. Now, we're going to see, um, so I'm going to write like this. This turns out to be really useful to us in differential equations. And it turns out to be the sort of our fundamental basis for, for everything that you do in 2112. All right. It simplifies a lot of the work in 2112. All right. <clears throat> and, but it's something we're not, we're going to, we're going to get into that part a little bit more, but clearly you can see this, you should be able to see this relationship make sense mathematically. Why this thing is useful is going to become more apparent as we go through differential equations, right? What, what this, what we say with this is, um, I define a couple of different things. How can I write this? separately, A e to the J omega T plus phi like that. I wanna separate that out a little bit. I like to get the T by itself, or at least I like to get the omega T by itself. So how could I do that? How could I get the omega T thing by itself? I have omega T plus phi. If I have E to the A plus B, what's that always equal to? Yeah. Right, if I have e to the a plus b, that's equal to what? e to the a times e to the b. I'm gonna say that this guy becomes a e to the j phi times e to the j omega t. <clears throat> now why, what's, what's, there's, when I look at this, right, this is one question I, a lot of you guys are, you're like, well, number 4C, I don't know how to do, how do I put in, in 4C if you've gotten that far in the homework? Everybody said, everybody's been putting in just a real number, right? I look at this, there's, there's three numbers here, right? There's A, E to the J phi, E to the J omega T. Two of those numbers are similar and one of them is different. Which two are similar? Depends how you look at it, maybe. Which two are constant? A and e to the j phi are both constant. What about e to the j omega t? That's not constant, is it? What's that guy doing? He changes with time, all right? As time advances, e to the j omega t is a vector that moves, all right? So what I, what I did at the very end of class last time is I defined and I said, all right, this, this whole statement here, I call this whole thing here, I call it a dynamic phaser. All right. What a phaser basically is, if I, if I call it this, I mean, it's basically a, a phaser is basically a complex number. It's a term that you're, you're gonna use, you're gonna say phasers all the time in 2112, but a phaser is basically a complex number. And a dynamic phaser, is one that changes as a function of time, okay? So what, would that, what does that look like in the complex plane? Like if I, plot, if I said to you, I wanna look at what A e to the J phi, e to the J omega t looks like in the complex plane, what would that look like? So here's the real, here's the imaginary. What would that look like in the complex plane? A vector that moves like a clock hand, except it wouldn't move like a clock hand in the normal sense. It would move like a counter clock hand. It would be like time was moving backwards, right? Which way is, when, when, when if T advances, this angle is advancing, right? 
So if I, if an angle is advancing in time, which way, which way does this guy move? So let's say here's a vector. Yeah, it's gonna move counterclockwise. If this guy here was e to the j omega t, as t advances, this guy's gonna move in that direction. In the forward direction is the counterclockwise direction. All right, I didn't make that definition, the world did a long time ago, okay? All right, so that guy moves that way. The thing that you use more often is, is in what I call the static phaser. In 2112, you will end up just calling this the phaser, all right, is A e to the J phi. The reason I call it static is what's true about that guy as time advances, that A e to the J phi. Based on our definitions that are associated with this, with this sinusoid, what's true about A e to the J phi? Does that change with time? No, that guy's totally constant. All right, he doesn't change with time. You're going to use that a lot, all right, in 2112. You're going to define A e to the J phi from looking at a, at a cosine wave, and then you're going to use that when you do circuit analysis. In other words, all your voltages and your currents and your circuits are going to be complex numbers. All right, you haven't gotten there yet probably in 2112, all right, but that's probably within a week or two. All right, that you'll start doing that. And from that point onward, you'll never stop. All right, it's all going to be complex numbers. Because of this relationship between complex numbers, all right, and sinusoids. Okay. All right. So the definitions there. Okay. So there's a couple of things that, that I often do. All right. I use Euler's identity to show how I can relate A cosine omega t plus phi into two complex vectors that are rotating, okay? I also say the static phaser is this guy, A to the J phi, all right? The dynamic phaser is this thing I'm taking the real part of, okay? Um, there should not be an A in front of that, okay? And the dynamic phaser rotates over time, okay? Now this guy here, if I, if I look at this here, that's one constant number, isn't it? A e to the J phi, right? So when I look at that, this guy is one number. I could enter that into MATLAB as one number. So in problem four on the homework, when I, when I ask you, I, I give you something like this guy here, right? So four cosine 1000 T plus 30 degrees. All right, so four cosine 1000 T plus 30 degrees. All right, let's say that was C1 e to the j. Um, I'll just give it to you as 1000 t plus C2 e to the minus j 1000 t, like that. And I said to you, I want to figure out C1 and C2. What approach do I take to figure out C1 and C2? <clears throat> What approach should I take for that? How would you, how would you even start that problem? No ideas? Yeah, basically you go back to the formula here, right? This, this page here has pretty much what I need. Right, when I, look at, when I look at this, I say, all right, I, I gave you an amplitude times a cosine 1000 T uh, plus 30 degrees, all right? So I gave you, in this case, that A is equal to four, omega is equal to a thousand, and phi is 30 degrees, okay? So when I look at that, I, I can basically say, okay, well, four cosine 1000 T plus 30 degrees, I could just go into my Euler's identity. And I know that if I have four cosine of theta, right? Or I'm just gonna say theta is omega T plus 30 or a thousand T plus 30, like that. I can just say that's four over two times E to the J theta plus four over two e to the minus j theta, right? 
And then I plop in there, well, theta is 1000 T plus 30 degrees. And I'm gonna end up being able to get C1 and C2 from that. Okay. That's the basic approach. Okay. The thing you gotta, you gotta bear in mind for that, you know, those of you who are struggling with that is, is, uh, is you're not seeing that when I, if I had, let's say two E to the J 30 degrees, that's one number right there, one constant number. It's a complex number, right? But it's one constant number. And this is what I call that static phasor. All right, that's the static phasor for this thing. The dynamic phasor for this thing, again, going back and looking at my definition here, my dynamic phasor, A e to the J phi, the only difference is I multiply it by e to the J omega t, which in this case is omega is 1,000, so it's e to the J 1,000 t. Okay, so this dynamic phasor rotates in time. Which direction does he rotate? This one? As time advances, this guy's gonna go which way? Counterclockwise, forward, right? <clears throat> and I'm also saying that if I, using this Euler's identity, I got another way to think of this guy. This guy is apparently rotating in the, he's, he's the sum of a vector rotating in the forward direction, that's this one. And then by having this negative here, which way is this guy going? His angle's going negative as time advances. So this guy's going clockwise. This guy's counterclockwise. This guy's clockwise. There's some, these two vectors that move, their sum is always real. All right, sort of a weird thing, all right? But this is the way that, the way that I think about this, right? If I have four cosine 1000 T plus 30 degrees, okay? What I've drawn here is basically, what this guy does is a function of time. This four e to the j 30 is the static phasor. The whole thing is the dynamic phasor. As time advances, what's the dynamic phasor gonna do? It's gonna move, right? What's the static phasor gonna do? Is it's gonna sit there, right? It's gonna stay the same. Now, what's this thing that I've drawn here? What's this, what's this little vector here that I've drawn? What is that? How does this line relate to this vector? Well, there's a 30 degree angle between them, right? You can read my, my, my stuff written here, but what, what is it? If I drew this vector, here's the vector I drew. Right, this vector here is the dynamic phasor at t equal to zero. So what is this down here? Is that the real number? That's the real part of it, right? The real part oh, is, is on the real axis. The imaginary part of it would be here, right? The thing is, what's gonna happen as time advances? Well, the real part's gonna shrink, isn't it? So let's, let's watch this, right? So I, I have it here. This is the static phasor. I kept it there, right? Why? This guy is sitting at 30 degrees because his static phasor has this 30 degree offset. As time advances, the static phasor stays the same, but where's the dynamic phasor gonna go? It's gonna go this way, right? It's gonna go in a counterclockwise direction. So here I am a little bit later in time. Here's the real part. So this is the dynamic phasor here. This is the static phasor. What do you notice about the real part there? The real part of this vector here. The real part of this vector, the real part of this vector, is it smaller or bigger than it was here? Smaller, right? Why? Well, because as this guy moved farther along, his amplitude, his magnitude stayed the same, right? The vector is staying the same length. It's just moving. So it's real parts getting smaller. So as time advances, if I plot the real part, okay, and that's what I have here, all right? So this is a t equal to zero. This is a little bit later. This is a little bit later. So what I'm showing on the bottom is what the real part looks like. So as I keep going, if I look at what the real part looks like, the real part is tracing out cosine as I go through one period. 
So what, so basically what I'm doing is I'm doing this at a couple of different times. Like here at t equal to zero, the dynamic phasor points at 30 degrees. At t equal to some later time, the dynamic phasor points at 60 degrees. Here it points at 90 degrees. When it's at 90 degrees and this guy's pointing straight up, what's the real part now? Zero. Zero, right, yeah. And then the real part's gonna become negative if I keep moving, right? Right now, because it's pointing into the, into the second quadrant. Now, if time keeps advancing, what's gonna happen to the real part? Is it gonna get bigger or smaller? Bigger, but more negative, right? So I keep going, it gets more negative. And so I keep going through this, right? And then eventually it's back to where it started, all right? So, all right, basically, as I go through one period, the dynamic phasor traces out a circle, right? That's the key thing. If I look at that, what that phasor is doing, it's tracing out a circle, all right? <clears throat> um, the real part of that guy traced out the cosine waveform, all right? And the static phasor didn't move. What you will use in 2112 is the static phasor, right? So Benny or whoever's teaching that will ask you for the phasor associated with a waveform. You'll look at that, that waveform and you'll say, what, you know, what is that A, E to the J, phi? What's the complex number that I associate with that thing? So let's look at an example. This is sort of like problem five in the homework. Um, so let's look at this guy. Here's problem five. Or it's problem five like, all right? So I'm giving you something that's 300 cosine 500 T minus 30 degrees. And I say, all right, I want to determine what's the static phasor, the dynamic phasor. And then in the Euler's identity, what's the forward rotating vector and the backward rotating vector? Okay, so let's start with the easy one. What's the static phasor for this? All right, first thing I do when I do this is I say, this has got to be the real part of something, right? So it's the real part of what? What is that the real part of? Go back and look, but somebody should know. What's that the real part of? All right, 300 e to the j theta. So I'm gonna, first of all, let me just define this guy here as theta, like that. I don't like to memorize formulas. One formula I know is that e to the j theta is cosine theta plus J sine theta. That's a formula that's worth remembering, right? It's one of only about 10 in the world that are worth remembering probably, all right? I write that like this, A e to the J theta. So I'm gonna say 500 T plus, I don't know, minus, I guess, minus 35 degrees, like that, okay? Now, looking at that right there, how can I get that into a form that gives me the, the static phasor? Real part of what? So I think Logan, it was what you were trying to say there. It's five, it's 300 times, times what? E to the negative 35 degree J times E to the J 500, 500 T. All right, What's, where's the static phasor and where's the dynamic phasor in that? Okay, what's, well, what's the first part to you? Okay, so let's, yeah, let's write it down here. So the static phasor is this 300, if I were to put this in the MATLAB, I would say 300 times EXP minus j times 35 times what if i was putting into matlab times pi over 180 pi over 180 right that's how i'd put that into matlab now the dynamic phaser is this whole thing all right in other words, the whole thing that can move. And then I say, give me the forward rotating vector and the backward rotating vector. And what I, what I mean from that is if I tried to get this guy into this form, A over two, E to the J phi, 
e to the j omega t plus a over two e to the minus j phi e to the minus j omega t. Which one of those is the forward rotator and which one's the backward rotator? Which one rotates forward? E to the j omega t. This is the forward. Forward is counterclockwise against time, I guess. All right. This guy is the backward rotator. clockwise all right so looking at that i want you guys to help me define here what's what's a what's phi what's omega in these things what's omega first of all 500 you should be able to do that by now for sure all right what's phi in this phi would be negative 35 degrees what's that mean for this guy over here He's going to be positive 35 degrees, isn't he? All right. What about, I guess that's it. That's all I have to define. If I was going to write this into, into MATLAB, I, I think, let's just look at my code that I wrote for that. Did I put that code in here? I didn't, but I should. All right, here's some MATLAB code I wrote for that one. All right. So what I do, I wrote omega, and again, this, this is me talking about variables, liking to use variables. Like I wrote, <clears throat> I could put the periods two pi over 500. I don't like that, right? I don't like hard coding a value in there. I put omega is 500, then I put it's two pi over omega. <clears throat> that way, if I, you know, if I had that in different places throughout my code, I could keep track of everything pretty easily. I, I like having those intermediate variables. So that way, if I wrote down that T was just a number, I didn't have it as a formula, I can make sense of formulas. It's hard for me to make sense of numbers, right? Whether that number is correct. I can look at that and know that that's the right formula. And I know that 500 is the right omega. All right, that's just a mental thing you have to get yourself used to, right? But it's a good way to, to start to look at these things. All right, and then I put in phi and then I put in A, right? Then, you know, I defined a time vector in terms of this. So, with this time vector I made, how many periods am I looking at with that time vector? How many periods do I have there? Two, right? Starts at negative T and ends at T, okay? And I had steps of T over a thousand. So my static phasor I, I defined here, and notice what I did, just like I said, right? I put in pi over 180. <clears throat> One thing you see about this too, if I use those intermediate variables like that, this is the same form as what I had, right? When I, when I look at it in the, in, the, in the notes, right? I can look at this and see, okay, I wrote the formula that's in the notes. As long as I wrote the inputs correct, I've got the right answer, right? That, that minimizes my thinking. If, I look, if I'm looking at this and I just see that it's like three plus four J, I don't know what that means, right? I can see that this matches what I have written as the formula in the notes or in the book, okay? So what I did was I used this compass command here. I, so I, I wanted to look at it. So I'm gonna evaluate that. And I can see, the reason I did that is, is when I look at this, it tells me, okay, so these numbers here are the radius. So I see this guy's got a, a, a radius of 300 for the circle. So that means the length of this vector is 300. That's what I expect it to be. And that angle, this guy's pointing over this way. That looks like about negative 35 degrees. Right, this line right here is at 330 degrees. 330 degrees is the same as what negative angle? Negative 30. And this guy looks like he's a little bit past negative 30. Right, so that would be about negative 35 degrees. Okay, so I can see that that makes some sense. Then what I did was I defined the counterclockwise and the clockwise. Right, so the counterclockwise, again, I just went in there and I put it in just like I defined it, right? I said the counterclockwise guy, A over two, E to the J phi, E to the J omega T. If I look at how I wrote that there, it's exactly how I wrote it here, right? That's why I, I, like, I like defining stuff like this in terms of variables, because I can just match formulas to what I'm writing down in my code, right? And, and I really shouldn't be wrong at that point. 
Again, that's not, that's not the way you're used to thinking of it, right? That's that the pencil and paper approach gets you into, into through a different way of thinking. But, but if you begin to look at it in code, the code should match the actual formula sheet. Okay. All right. And then the dynamic phaser, the only difference thing about that, right, was I take the static phaser and multiply it by e to the j omega t. Okay. All right. Questions about what I did right there for those steps. This is a lot like problem five. The one thing I, I didn't, do I guess problem five also asks you questions about what's the value of these things at a particular value of theta. So let's say I did that. Let's say I want to figure out what's the value at, at a particular value of theta equal to 30 degrees. What time, first of all, at what time does this thing here equal 30 degrees? All right, theta equals, all right, theta equals 500 T minus 35 degrees. If I ask you at what time does that vector have an angle of 30 degrees? How do I solve for that? What time does that happen? It's just algebra, right? Right. I just have to say at what time does 500 T minus 35 equals 30, right? So it's whenever 500 T equals 65 degrees, right? Whatever time that is, all right? is gonna be the time when this thing is gonna be equal to, to, to 30 degrees, okay? Because remember, what's happening is this thing is a vector that's moving around. So it's the angle of the vector is moving and you're trying to figure out at what time does the, does the vector have that angle, all right? Now, if you go into MATLAB and you start trying to use this, you're gonna be out of luck. What did I do wrong here about this? Yeah, well, it's actually mixed degree. So this is the 500 times T. What's the units of, of this right here? Radians, yeah. So this guy is in radians. So in other words, you never see anybody have degrees per second, all right? They have radians per second, all right? Radians per second and degrees. So what I would probably have to do, if I were to put this in the MATLAB, I'd say minus 35 times pi over 180. Is, is equal to 30 times pi over 180. And that will get me to the time if I do it that way, okay? All right, you guys should be able to figure it out from there. All right, so I got some more stuff to, to cover. Make sense? You can use that if you want, yeah. It's all a matter of preference at that point. I, you know, in my mind, I, I, knowing that it's pi over 180, 180 over pi, I just find it, to me, it's like converting from kilometers to miles or something like that. That's the way I think of it, right? All right. All right, <clears throat> so one last thing here. So this, um, let's say I have something like this, x to the fourth equals one. I said complex numbers kind of came around because people had things like x squared plus one equals zero, right? And they said, well, x squared plus one, if I plot that, you learned how to plot graphs and parabolas in high school, right? Does this thing ever cross zero? It doesn't, right? And so we say the roots of that, it still has roots, all right? And if you study something called complex analysis, you'll see all kinds of stuff. There's there's, there's stuff they talk about that in math and complex analysis about what that looks like in a, in a multi-dimensional space. We don't wanna get into that world right now, right? This guy, so it's, what are the roots of X squared plus one? The roots of X squared plus one, I get X squared equals minus one. So X equals plus or minus J, okay? Let's say I had this guy here, X to the fourth equals one. What's X in that case? One. Looks like it should be, right? What's the fundamental theorem of algebra? I mentioned that. It has as many roots. It actually turns out there's one, there's a word missing from that statement. It has four unique roots. Okay? Four unique roots. If I say the answer here is one, four times, 
Are those unique? No. All right. So let's do it this way. X to the fourth is equal to a complex number. All right. Where is, if I tried to plot one in the complex plane, where is one in the complex plane? So here's my complex plane here. Where is one? On the x-axis. On the x-axis. So one is right here. All right. What is the magnitude? So one is a complex number. What's its magnitude? One, not a trick question. What's its angle? Is it really zero? It is, it is zero, it has an angle of zero, right? But is it just zero? It could be 360 as well. So she, couldn't I say this guy is e to the j zero degrees? Right, e to the j zero degrees. Couldn't I also say it's e to the j 360 degrees? Couldn't I also say it was e to the j 720 degrees? Right? Aren't those all equivalent? What's the next one? I guess it's e to the j 1024, I think. Not 1024, 1080, right? Counting binary, <clears throat> right? So the, what, I, what I have is I say, well, I could actually come up with, with four different roots for that thing, four unique roots. I could say basically that X would be equal to one, or I could say it's E to the J 360 divided by four, right? What did I do here, right? Let me be careful with this. Go back to here. If I have X to the N equal to one, like this, I can say that this is equal to E to the J zero degrees, E to the J 360 degrees, E to the J 720 degrees like that, okay? And this, this continues, there's many different choices for this, okay? I can say X, so if I gave you X to the N equal to one, what's the answer? X equals what? X equals what? It's one, but one to the what power? If I have something to the one over N power, right? So X is equal to, in this particular case, E to the J, zero degrees divided by n, which is just simply one, right? What, what else could it be equal to? E to the what? E to the j360 divided by n, right? E to the j720 divided by n, so on and so forth. Now I said unique roots, right? So the very last one would be uh, e to the j um, uh, let me let's see I, I think I wrote down the formula so I don't have to try to okay yeah there we go all right <clears throat> it goes all the way up to n minus one right so there's there's gonna if I unique roots what I say is the number one is equal to e to the j two pi n, little n, right? And that goes from n equal to zero up to n minus one, like that, okay? Now, let's go back to the problem I gave you, okay? X to the fourth equals one, okay? And I know that there has to be four unique roots, okay? You could do each one of those roots by hand, but one way to do this would be to try to do this in MATLAB, wouldn't it? Right? I can, how could I have MATLAB solve this for me? What would be an approach to have MATLAB solve this for me? All right, so first of all, what I see here is X to the fourth equals one. So X, so one of the roots is E to the J, the, the roots are always this, two pi N, divided by four, All right? Those, those are my roots, right? Doesn't this look like a good job for a for loop, right? 
So how would I write a for loop to do this? Any ideas? I could do a vector for n. Yeah. So how about how about this? All right. So I'm going to just write it out this way. So what I did was I so I actually just wrote this guy out as I said, okay, n n equals four, right? And I have x equals e to the j two pi little n divided by capital N, right? Because this this statement is true. And then I have to solve this for n equal to zero all the way up to n minus one. Okay. So notice what I did. I have a for loop that goes from zero to n minus one in increments of one. All right. Explain this statement to me. What did I write there? That looks like this formula, doesn't it? It looks like that formula, almost, doesn't it? What's different about what I wrote here? This, first of all, this side of the expression is the same, isn't it? What about this side? Why do I have an n plus one over here? Why do I have an n plus one? Because I have to. <laughs> MATLAB starts indexing from, from one, right? So when you plugged in n equal to zero, if I wrote x of zero is equal to e x p j zero, right? This side would calculate fine, but MATLAB would say index out of bounds or whatever its error would be, right? I did an n plus one because I want the, when n equals zero, it's gonna be the first entry. When n equals one, it's gonna be the second entry. When n equals three, it's gonna be, right? So you, that's the way you want it to, to flow, right? Now notice what I did here, all right? So I used this compass command to plot this guy, right? So X is gonna be a, a row vector if I looked at this thing and I had it plot for me the roots. So here's one of them. Here's one of them, here's one of them, and here's one of them, right? So all four of them. Now, what do you notice about their locations? Two on the imaginary and two on the real axis, right? But what's, what's the angle between them? Each one's 90 degrees apart or 360 degrees divided by four apart. If I had told you I had X to the five equal to one, it would be the exact same process. And the angle between them would be what? 360 divided by five, all right? Because if I, if <clears throat> that's gonna guarantee that I've got unique roots there to this, this solution, all right? So one thing that some of you guys may, may find problematic is I tell you to write the answers into MATLAB you, can, you don't need to use the for loop if you don't want to, all right? One thing you wanna probably check, if you wanna do them all by hand, you could do that, right? You could say, you know, X one equals, and you could, you could just go through the formula and you could say EXP J two pi zero divided by four. And then you could do two. So first of all, why have I said, why did I do this in terms of two pi N? What, what's it what, what's mean when I'm doing a two pi n? Why didn't I do 360 n? Two pi is in radians, right? So, so we gotta be, remember, we're gonna do these formulas, we gotta do them in radians, right? So the one thing you guys may run into is I tell you that you specifically have to enter them, I think from the smallest angle to the largest, all right? And they all have to be positive, right? So it's looking for them to be in a particular order. In other words, if you get four numbers here, you can't put them in at random. Right, I'm telling you that you have to put them in from the smallest angle to the largest angle. All right, so you got a specific procedure that you're supposed to follow in doing that. Now, let's say I have something more generally that looks like this. 
right? Um, X to the N equal to A, right? What do I do in that case? There should still be N unique roots, right? So how do I solve for that? So let's say, let's say for sake of argument that I had this guy here. So the, let's say this is four with an angle of 45 degrees. What is that also equal to? Isn't that four with what other angle? 45 plus what? Plus 360, okay? So more generally what I have is something like this, right? I can say angle of A plus two pi little n like that, right? And then I can go through same sort of thing. So if you look at the, the notes when I post them here, you see basically the same sort of thing, right? I can go through and I can solve using this same sort of expression, just going through and looping through those values of n, okay? So it's, it's pretty straightforward to, to do this, right? You're gonna, you're gonna be a little bit confused at first, but I think, the basic process, you guys should understand the math of this. Now there's more on this, I think specifically, if you look at it, I think it's in section 4.4 uh, in the book, all right? So it's called out here in the notes, what section, if you wanna look at more details on that, all right? But it's a pretty straightforward process. And then I'll, I'll post this, like I said, as soon as I can, right after this class, so you can look at the, the, the way that I coded it up for those two examples. All right, stop. <clears throat>